Piers Plowman by William Langland Passes 2 Still kneeling on my knees, I renewed my plea for grace, and said, Mercy, madam, for Mary's love in heaven, who bore the blissful babe that bought us on the cross. Teach me some talent to distinguish the false. Look on your left side, and lo, where he stands, both false and fable, and lots of fellows of theirs. I looked on my left side, as the lady told me, and was aware of a woman wonderfully dressed. Her gown was faced with fur, the finest on earth, crowned with a coronet, the king has none better. Her fingers were filigreed, fanciful with gold, and rich rubies on them, as red as hot coals, and diamonds most dear of cost, and two different kinds of sapphires, pearls and precious water stones to repel poisons. Her robe was most rich, dyed with red scarlet, with ribbons of red gold and with rich stones. Her array ravished me. I'd seen such riches nowhere. I wondered who she was and whose wife she might be. Who is this woman, I said, so worthily attired? That is Mead, the maid who has harmed me very often and maligned my lover, Lute, is his name, and has told lords who enforce laws lies about him. In the Pope's palace she's a privileged as I am. But soothness would not have it so, for she is a bastard, and her father was false. He has a fickle tongue, and never told the truth since the time he came on earth. And Mead has manners like his, as men say is natural. Like father, like son, a good tree brings forth good fruit. I ought to be higher than she. I came of much better parentage. My father is the great God, the giver of all graces, one God without beginning, and I'm his good daughter. And he's granted me that I might marry mercy as my own. And any man who's merciful and loves me truly shall be my lord, and I his love, aloft in heaven. And the man who takes mead, I'll bet my head on it, shall lose for her love a lump of caritatis. What does David the king declare of men that crave mead, and of others on earth who uphold truth, and how you shall save yourselves? The Psalter bears witness. Lord, who shall dwell in thy tabernacle? etc. And now this mead is being married to a most accursed wretch, to one false fickle tongue. A fiend begot him. Favel, through his fair speech, has these folk under enchantment, and it's all by a liar's leadership that this lady is thus wedded. Tomorrow we will be made the maiden's bridal. If you, if you wish, you may witness there who they all are that belong to that lordship, the lesser and the greater. Acquaint yourself with them if you can, and keep clear of them all. And don't malign them, but let them be until loot becomes justice and has power to punish them. Then put forth your evidence. Now I commend you to Christ, she said, and to Christ's pure mother, and don't let your conscience be overcome by coveting mead. Thus that lady left me lying asleep, and how mead was married was shown to me in a dream. How all the rich retinue that rule with false were bidden to the bridal for both sides of the match. 
of all manner of men, the moneyless and the rich. To marry off this maiden, many men were assembled, including knights and clerks and other common people, such as assizers and summoners, sheriffs and their clerks, beadless and bailiffs and brokers of merchandise harbingers and hostlers and advocates of the arches i can't reckon the rabble that ran around mead but simony and civil and assizers of court were most intimate with mead of any men i thought but favel was the first that fetched her from her bedroom and like a broker brought her to be joined to false when Simony and Civil saw the couple's wish, they assented for Silver to say as both wanted. Then Liar leapt forth and said, Lo, here's a charter that Guile with his great oaths has given them jointly. And he prayed Simony to inspect it and Civil to read it. Simony and Civil both stand forth and unfold the conveyance that false has made then these characters commence to cry on high let men now living and those to come after know etc let all who are on earth hear and bear witness that Mead is married more for her property than for any goodness or grace or any goodly parentage. Falseness fancies her, for he knows she's rich, and Fable with his fickle speech, and Foth and Enfioths them by this charter that they may be princes in pride and despise poverty backbite and boast and bear false witness scorn and scold and speak slander disobedient and bold break the ten commandments and the earldom of envy and ire together with the castellet of quarrelling and uncurbed gossip the county of covetousness and the countryside about that is usury and avarice all i grant them in bargainings and brokerings with the borough of theft with all the lordship of lechery in length and in breadth as in works and in words and with watching of eyes and in wild wishes and fantasies and with idle thoughts when to do what their wills would they want the strength gluttony gluttony he gave them two and great oaths together and to drink all days at diverse taverns and to jabber there and joke and judge their fellow christians and to gobble food on fasting days before the fitting time and then to sit supping till sleep assails them and grow portly as town pigs and repose in soft beds till sloth and sleep sleek their sides and then they'll wake up with wan hope with no wish to amend for he believes he's lost this is their last fortune and they to have and to hold and their heirs after them a dwelling with the devil and be damned forever with all the appurtenances of purgatory into the pain of hell yielding for this thing at some year's end their souls to satan to suffer pain with him and, and to live with him in woe while god is in heaven to witness, to witness which thing wrong was the first, and Piers the pardoner of Pauline doctrine, Bart the beadle of Buckinghamshire, Reynold the reeve of Rutland district, Mun the miller, and many more besides. 
in date of the devil this deed is sealed in sight of sir simony and with civil's approval then theology grew angry when he heard all this talk and said to civil now sorrow on your books to permit such a marriage to make truth angry and before this wedding is performed may it befall you foul since mead is mulier amends is her parent god granted to give mead to truth and you've bestowed her on a deceiver now god send you sorrow the text does not tell you so truth knows what's true for dignus est operarius to have his hire and you fastened her to false fie on your law for you live wholly by lies and by lecherous acts simony and yourself are sullying holy church the notaries and you are noxious to the people you shall both make amends for it by god that made me you know well you wastrels unless your wits are failing that false is unflaggingly fickle in his deeds and like a bastard born of beelzebub's kindred and mead is a mulier a maiden of property she could kiss the king for cousin if she wished work with wisdom and your wit as well lead her to london where law is determined if it's legally allowable for them to lie together and if the justice judges it's right to join her with false yet be wary of the wedding for truth is wise and discerning and conscience is of his counsel and knows all your characters and if he finds that you've offended and are of are of false's followers it shall be beset your souls most sourly in the end civil assents to this but simony was unwilling till he had silver for his seals and the stamps of the notaries then fable fetched forth florins enough and bade guile go give gold all about and don't neglect the notaries see that they need nothing and fee false witness with florins enough for he may overmaster me and make her obey me when this gold had been given, there was a great thanking to False and Fable for their fair gifts, and they all came to comfort False from the care that afflicted him, and said, Be sure we shall never cease our efforts till Mead is your wedded wife through wit of us all, for we've overmastered Mead with our merry speech so that she grants to go with a good will to london to learn whether law would judge you jointly in joy forever then false felt well pleased and fable was glad and they sent to summon all men in shrines about and bade them all be ready beggars and others to go with them to Westminster to witness this deed. And then they had to have horses to haul them thither, when Fable fetched foals of the best, set Mead on a sheriff shod all new, and False sat on an assizer, as softly trotted, and Fable on fair speech, clad in feigning clothes when notaries had no horses and were annoyed also because simony and civil should walk on foot but then simony swore and civil as well that summoners should be saddled and serve them all and let these provisors be put in palfrey's harness 
Sir Simony himself shall sit on their backs. Deans and subdeans, you draw together, archdeacons and officials, and all your registrars. Let them be saddled with silver to suffer our sins, such as adultery and divorce and clandestine usury, to bear bishops about, abroad on visitations. Pauline's people, for complaints in the consistory, shall serve myself. Civil is my name. And let the commissary be cart-saddled, and our cart pulled by him. And he must fetch us victuals from fornicatores, and make a long cart of lyre, loaded with all the rest such as twisters and tricksters that trot on their feet. False and fable fare forth together, and mead in the mist, and her serving men behind. I've no opportunity to tell of the tale of the procession, of many manner of men that move over this earth, but guile was foregoer and guided them all, Soothness saw them well and said but a little, and pressed a head on his palfrey and passed them all, and came to the king's court and told conscience about it, and conscience recounted it to the king afterward. By Christ, said the king, if I can catch false or fable, or any of his followers, I'll be avenged on those villains that act so viciously, and have them hanged by the neck, and all who support them. Shall no bondsman be allowed to go bail for the least, but whatever law will allot, let it fall on them all. And he commanded a constable that came straight away to detain, detain those tyrants, despite their treasure, I say, fetter falseness fast, no matter what he gives you, and get Guile's head off at once. Let him go no farther, and bring mead to me, no matter what they do. Simony and Civil. I send to warn them that their actions will hurt Holy Church forever. And if you lay hand on Liar, don't let him escape before he's put in the pillory for any prayer he makes. Dread stood at the door and heard this declaration how the king commanded constables and sergeants that falseness and his fellowship should be fettered and bound. Then Dread came away quickly and cautioned false and bade him flee for fear and his fellows too. Then falseness for fear fled to the friars, and Guile in dread of death dashed away fast. But merchants met with him, and made him stay, and shut him up in their shops to show their wares, apparelled him as an apprentice to wait on purchasers. Lightly, Lyre leapt away then, lurking through lanes belabored by many. Nowhere was he welcome for his many tales, everywhere hunted out and ordered to pack till pardoners took pity and pulled him indoors, washed him and wiped him, and wound him in cloths, and set him on Sundays with seals to church, where he gave pardon for pennies by the pound about. Then doctors were indignant and drafted letters to him, that he should come and stay with them to examine urine, Apothecaries wanted to employ him to appraise their wares, for he was trained in their trade and could distinguish many gums. But minstrels and messengers met with him once, and had him with them half a year and eleven days. 
friars with fair speech fetched him thence to keep him safe from the curious they coped him as a friar but he has leave to leap out as often as he pleases and is welcome to come when he wants and stay with them often all fled for fear and flew into corners except for mead the maid none remained there but truly to tell she trembled for dread and twisted about tearfully when she was taken into custody <laughs>